Halloween is very much known around the world as an American holiday. No one does Halloween like the Americans do. But did you know that the only reason they celebrate Halloween was because they were trying to be more British? And in fact, they adopted the holiday as an attempt for the growing middle class to emulate the fashionable interest in Halloween set by Queen Victoria. And what if I told you that the Great Depression and vandalism is the only reason we have haunted house attractions and that we decorate our houses for trick-or-treaters? Well, this is the story of how Halloween came to the new world and how trick-or-treating became the famed American annual event. But before we start talking about candy, we actually need to talk about famine. In 1845, Ireland was struck by a mould which caused what is known as the Great Potato Famine. Although estimates vary, it is believed as many as one million Irish men, women and children perished during the famine, and another one to two million emigrated from Ireland to escape poverty and starvation, with many landing in various cities throughout North America and Great Britain. Now, the Irish weren't the only Celt in America at the time. By the 1800s, more than one million Scots had emigrated to the United States. And the Scots had been coming over since the Vikings, but many had come over as part of outlaw politics for trade reasons in the 17th century and as a result of the Highland clearances. But where does Halloween and Queen Victoria come into the equation? Well, by 1837, Queen Victoria had ascended to the throne and she was very popular amongst the British and the Americans, which was likely influenced by the British and Irish immigrants and with her association of the ascension of the British power. You see, the admiration of Queen Victoria took many forms, such as the popularisation of the white wedding dress in American society following the Queen's marriage to Prince Albert in 1840. And we saw it again in the United States with their somber response to her death in 1901. So Victoria was on the throne during the Industrial Revolution and the technological advances of Britain trickled over to America. As industry increased, it created what is known as a new middle class. And this middle class transformed society as everyone knew it. Now this is where you learn that trick-or-treating today as you know it was technically really a middle class invention. You see, as Queen Victoria was so popular and she was a role model across the pond, the middle class in America made attempts to emulate her. You see, she was somewhat of a trendsetter and that included her interest in Halloween. Queen Victoria was fascinated by spooky rituals. And in 1866, after paying a visit to Mrs. Grant, the mother of John Grant, the head keeper at Balmoral, on the afternoon of the 31st of October, Victoria saw children carrying torches and making bonfires on the hills on the other side of the river. These, she noted in her journal, had a very pretty effect. By 1868, this trip for tea on the estate before joining in the Halloween celebrations had become something of a ritual for Victoria and her youngest children. She describes in her Highland journal, quote, Mrs. Grant gave us whisked cream, as she called it, with oatmeal sprinkled on top, which she said everybody eats at Halloween. At six, the torches begin to be lit up. Louise, Leopold and Christian, each carrying Warren, and Lenchen and I drove. On nearing the castle, numbers met us and we remained out to see all walking around. Then some reels were danced around a blazing fire, made from piles of torches. It had a wild effect, but unfortunately, the wind was terribly high. In subsequent years, on the 31st of October, the Queen would drive out from the castle in an open carriage carrying lighted torches. She was followed by a procession of over a hundred torch-bearing royal servants and tenants from the local farms with their families, who were all accompanied by a piper. Her experience of Halloween at Balmoral Castle in 1869 was widely reported upon, and it's no coincidence that Halloween traditions started becoming popular in America a few years afterwards. There's a little short story about it in a popular ladies' magazine that was printed in 1870. In it, it calls Halloween an English holiday celebrated by children. It detailed how children would visit houses, but they first must step over a broom laid in front of the front door to protect the house from witches. And then the children would tell fortunes to the inhabitants by burning nuts, pouring hot lead into water, reading the shapes, and then laying out cards. The children would also play Lucky Bowls and Snapdragon. 
a game in which a shallow bowl of brandy was heated and raisins were placed in the brandy and set alight. And the game involved snatching the raisins from the burning brandy and extinguishing the flames in their mouths as they ate them. Yes, Victorian children were made of much stronger stuff than all of us combined. Bonfires also made their way over to America, but the popularity died out after one particular incident, which was reported on in 1908, of a bonfire in which several little boys dressed up as ghosts um, were nearly pushed into the bonfire alive by a little boy who was dressed up as the devil. They were doing a little thing. They were having a whale of a time, but it didn't really pan out. At the beginning of the 1900s, American Halloween celebrations took on more of an Irish twist. They introduced trick-or-treating. Now, from the Middle Ages in Ireland, there was a Christian tradition known as souling, in which children and the poor went from door to door offering songs or prayers for the dead in exchange for money, kindling, for fires or food. The common food they received was a soul cake, a flatbread that consisted of allspice, nutmeg, cinnamon, ginger and other sweet spices, and raisins and currants. Souling was once performed throughout the British Isles, and the earliest activities were reported in 1511. Shakespeare even mentions it, with the pulling like a beggar at Hallowmas in Two Gentlemen of Verona in 1593. However, by the end of the 19th century, the extent of the practice during All Hallows Tide was limited to parts of England and Wales. But where does the tricking part enter the equation? Well, in Scotland and Ireland, there was already a tradition known as guising, which had evolved from souling, when young people dressed up in costumes and accepted offerings from various households. However, rather than pledging to pray for the dead, they would sing a little song, recite a poem, tell a joke, or perform a sort of trick before collecting their treat, which typically consisted of fruits, nuts, and coins. Additionally, there was a Christmas tradition known as Belsnickeling, which came over from Belsnickel, a companion figure of Santa Claus in the German folklore. You may have seen this if you watch um, The Office and Dwight Schrute dresses up as Belsnickel. As Dwight Schrute tells us, Belsnickel would rap on the windows and doors of German homes just a couple of weeks before Christmas. And after being admitted into a house by the curious children, Belsnickel either handed out treats like cakes and candies and fruit and nuts, or um, he distributed smacks uh, with the switch that he carried. The choice obviously depended on the children's behaviour throughout the year. Now, Belsnickeling had become popular in the eastern part of America, and the two traditions, with the Irish and Scottish emigrants, collided that made children that used to perform tricks when they were guising into actual pranks, and they made the pranks look as though supernatural forces had conjured them. But the trickery was not solely an American invention. Uh, there's a line about fearful pranks in Halloween by Scottish poet John Mayne in 1780, and a poem about Halloween celebrations that likely influenced Robert Burns' poem about the same theme half a decade later. So throughout the years, pranks continued to become a popular feature of Halloween, both in the UK and America, and they took many forms. A lot of pranks focused on people's homes and properties, and anything left around the home was basically fair game for mischief. The windows and doors were rattled and belongings would be cast away, cows would be let loose or wagons would be deconstructed and then reconstructed elsewhere, like on top of the roof of a barn. So Halloween became a night of mischief for cheeky children. But the focus on pranking over treats became somewhat of a problem, so much so that Halloween began to be known as the Devil's Night, Mischief Night, Cabbage Night or Gate Night, particularly on the East Coast pockets of America where Irish and Scottish immigration was particularly high. It was given these names because at the time of the year, children would basically unhinge farmers' gates, hence gate night, and steal them away, putting them in trees or in the middle of a town, or they would throw cabbages and eggs at houses. But it didn't stop there. Sometimes they would go so far as disturbing the dead and stealing bodies from the graves. Every year the challenges escalated uh, and pranking became harder and harder to outdo itself. In 1879, about 200 boys in Kentucky stopped a train by laying a fake stuffed body across the railroad tracks. And in 1900, medical students at the University of Michigan stole a headless corpse from the anatomy lab and then propped it up against the building's front doors. One boy's guide uh, in America said, quote, 
This is the only evening on which a boy can feel free to play pranks outdoors without danger of being pinched. It is his delight to scare passing pedestrians, ring doorbells or carry off a neighbour's gate. According to the guide, even if a boy had to fetch the gate that he stole out of a tree that he left it in, quote, the punishment is nothing compared with the sports the pranks have furnished him. So Halloween was all reasonably harmless and good fun until the Great Depression hit. In 1933, parents were outraged when hundreds of teenage boys flipped over cars, sawed off telephone poles, and engaged in other acts of vandalism across the country. The extreme amount of vandalism that occurred on Halloween made it refer to that Halloween of the Great Depression as Black Halloween, very similar to how they referred to the stock market crash four years earlier as Black Tuesday. While some of the cities debated banning Halloween and trick-or-treating altogether, others encouraged people to deter boys from approaching their homes by making them spooky and unappealing. A 1937 pamphlet advised homeowners to make a trail of terror to their houses during the nights of Halloween. It advised people to quote, hang old fur, strips of raw liver on the walls where one feels his way up the dark steps. Weird moans and howls should come from the dark corners. Damp sponges and wet hair nets should hang from the ceiling and touch his face. Doorways should be blockaded so that guests must crawl through a long, dark tunnel. Yet, as you can imagine for young teenage boys, the deterrent for the pranksters only added to the excitement and the challenge of the holiday, which is why people still dress up their houses for Halloween and why children continue to come to your door every year asking for treats. Thankfully, they are nicer with their tricks these days. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you liked it, please consider liking and subscribing to my channel for more fun little history videos. And I will see you soon for another video. Have a happy Halloween and remember, books save lives. So keep reading.